Ema is both the first woman and the first Irish person to fill the role of chosen chief of the Order of Bards, Ovates and Druids, a title she was raised to in June 2020, as well as the first to be inaugurated as such online. So double congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. With her late husband, Howard Campbell, she founded the Kilkenny Druid Grove with the aim of promoting druidry as a creative way of living in balance with the natural world. Their grove, which is based in Kilkenny, hosts celebrations for all eight festivals in the wheel of the year, and the ceremony is attended by druids and pagans of all paths, as well as by people from all sections of their local community. She is a member of the Druid clan of Dana and a priestess in the Fellowship of Isis. Ema is a counseling psychologist, shamanic therapist, Reiki and Seishem master and herbalist. She's worked with a number of traditional healers in Tanzania, exchanging ideas and identifying similarities to the Druid path. And she's a practice storyteller. Amongst her claims to fame are that she was featured in the TV documentaries, There's Something About Patrick, and Lesser Spotted Journeys. She works as a supervisor with psychotherapists, psychologists, social workers, advocates, and substance abuse workers. She's a guest lecturer on BA and MA courses in development studies in Dublin and Tanzania. A board member and chairperson of the Child Care Advisory Committee of Barrettstown, which is an international residential therapeutic recreation camp for children with serious illnesses. She also acts as a consultant psychotherapist with Smashing Times Theatre Company. And tonight she'll be talking to us about the goddess in Irish mythology. Welcome, Ema, and over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Emlyn. That was um, a bit cringy listening to all that. But anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> um, so the title of this talk is, is, is The Goddess in Mythology. I, I'm going to expand that. Um, uh, I'm, I love storytelling and I love the Irish myths. And um, when I when I joined Obod, you know, it was really incumbent upon me to really, really engage and immerse myself in story and what we can learn from it. And um, our stories tend to be very, very patriarchal. So the poor woman or the goddess or the heroine often gets a bad um, showing. Either she's forceful, evil, jealous. We have the Kalyuk, the, the crone. Uh, she features in stories and she eventually get, she invariably gets killed off. Um, there's Deirdre of the Sorrows who caused battles and you have Maeve and she's caused a big war, and that Danu, who's the mother of the gods and goddesses of um, the, she's the mother of the gods and goddesses of this land, the Tuha Jedanan. There are no stories about her, but she's embedded in the landscape. And what's really, really interesting, so many of our goddesses are embedded in the landscape. We don't actually have figures like you'll have, we say, the Venus of um, Willendorf and other such uh, icons of the goddess to be found in in uh, other parts of the world we don't she's there in she features in the landscape so instead of giving you a talk about the goddess in mythology i'm going to tell you a story and this is a story about mish now she's not exactly called a goddess but she has the qualities of and she's also uh there's a mountain after her Schlieve mish so i'm going to start the story This is a story about what can cause madness and what can cure madness. A long time ago in a far off country, there was a very wealthy man called Doira Doyal. Now he was very well respected, he was very wise. And not only was he wealthy, but he was also renowned for his prowess with the sword. And the one person most precious to him was his daughter Mish. Now, Mish had long golden hair and her eyes were as green as the shoots in springtime and the lips, her lips were as red as hawberries at autumn time. And not only was she beautiful, she had the strength of the stag, the stamina of the boar, the wisdom of the salmon 
and the perception of the hog. And you can imagine that her hand was sought far and wide. Suitors from all over the world came wishing to marry her, but she was having none of it. Not one of them was a worthy consort for her. And her father too agreed, and he felt that where they were living, she was not going to have much of a future. So he decided, with consulting her, that they would leave this place. There was nothing to keep them. His wife had died a long, long time ago, and she, Mish, was so precious to him. He only wanted the best for her. So they sold off all their worldly goods, chartered a ship, and set sail. And for about three weeks they were on the high seas and eventually they found land and they landed off the coast of Kerry in Ireland in a place called Danganikush or Dang Dingle. And they sailed into Dingle Harbour and the boat docked and they disembarked and they found some lodgings. And the next day Doira headed westward out towards Dun Quinn looking for some land. And it's hard to get land in that place now, but it was even harder in those days. But eventually he met a landowner who was willing to give him some land. And Doira Doyal said, money is no object. You just name your price. And the landowner said, I don't want your money, but what I want is your skills with a sword. Because your reputation precedes you. And so Doira agreed to lend his skills with a sword. And it was agreed that the next day he would go to Fiantral to fight in this battle. It was known as the Battle of Ventry. So he was very, very pleased and he headed back to the lodgings to where Mish was waiting with the good news that he had found land. And she said, and what is the price? And he said, oh, nothing. And she said, what is the price? How much did he ask for? Well, he didn't ask for any money, but all he wants are my skills with a sword. And Mish, her heart nearly stopped. She said, please, Father, do not go. You are all I have in this world and you will perish. And he said, nonsense. Have I ever lost a battle yet? You know how skilled I am with the sword. It's, it's a mere skirmish. I promise you, I'll be back by tea time. And no matter how she begged, there was no way. He said, this is a mere trifle. I can manage, I promise you. I'll be back by tea time tomorrow. And they spent one last evening together and she was broken hearted. And then they went to bed and she tossed and turned all night because she did not think she'd ever see her father again if he went off into that battle. So it was a very sad parting and there were tears in her eyes as she hugged him goodbye. And he looked into her eyes and he said, I promise you, I'll be back by tea time. And she watched Sadly, as he went down the street on his horse, heading out westwards to Fionnthral, to the battle. Well, the battle lasted all day. There were no winners, there were no losers, but everybody was slain. And such is the, with the ways of these battles, it was futile. And when he didn't come back at tea time, Mish got on a horse and she headed out towards Fionnthral herself. And when she arrived at the battlefield, there she saw death and mayhem before her, the bodies of the slain being picked clean by the ravens and the crows. And then she could see Maka, Bive, and the Morrigan, those three goddesses waiting, waiting to take the souls of the slain to the other world. And then she began to look at the bodies. Maybe, maybe, maybe her father might be okay. At worst, maybe he's just wounded. So she looked through all these bodies, these dead bodies on this battlefield. And eventually she found him dead, lying in his own blood. And she wept and she wailed as she saw him. Such was her grief that she threw herself down on him and she began to drink his blood. And when she had drunk her fill, this act, one last act she could do for her father, he was now ready, ready to pass through the veil, to go with the Morrigan or Bive or Maka 
across to the other world. And as she drank the last of his blood, she locked her grief deep within her heart. Locked it so tight it would never come out again. And she jumped up and in a frenzy of madness and rage, she flew up into the air and landed on a mountain to the east. To this day is known as Shli of Mish, Mountain of Mish. And such was her anger and rage, she could never sit still. She spent 400 years running back and forth along that mountain, raging, weeping and wailing at anyone who heard her sound. It put the fear and terror in their hearts. And even parents would threaten their naughty children with Mish if they didn't behave. And over the years, her lay hair became long and matted and like dreaded dreadlocks rough and coarse and her nails grew as long and as sharp as the talons of an eagle. She grew whiskers. She became madder and madder and any living creature that came within arm's reach she would grab in her talons and tear them to shreds and devour them. Now every few years some young men trying to prove their valour and worth would dare each other and they'd go up the mountain in an attempt to control and to slay Mish. But as soon as she laid eyes on them, she grabbed them with her talons and tear them to shreds. And the years went on and she ran back and forth in her rage and anger at what had happened to her. And it was during the reign of Phelan MacRiffin, the King of Munster, that he was a most enlightened man. He knew Mish could not be controlled by sword or bow and arrow. And he issued a decree that nobody was to slay her. But he offered a reward to anyone who could bring her back down the mountain safely. So when the word got out, all the young warriors of Munster, they went up the mountain trying their luck. But of course, as soon as she laid eyes on them, she grabbed them in her talons and tore them to shreds. And then the warriors from Leinster and Connacht and Ulster and from Britain and Europe and from the four corners of the earth all came. Nobody succeeded in catching Mish and bringing her down the mountain. Now, Phelan had a famous harper called the Rush. Now, he was a most magical harper and he had that ability that when his hands laid on the strings, he created the most magical of sounds. And he was able to call out the three noble strains from the harp. And the first strain is the joyful strain. This is a little idea of how it goes. Again, three, the joyful strain. The second strain was the sorrowful strain of the gold three. And 
the third strain was the Suan Three, the soothing strain or the lullaby. Well, Dov Rush went to Phelim and said, King Phelim, why don't you let me try my luck? Let me see if I can bring Mish back down the mountain. And Phelim laughed at him. He said, you, with your heart? Surely when warriors from the four corners of the earth have failed, how could you think that you could hope to bring her back? And he said, please, give me a chance. I know I can bring her back. All I ask for you, from you, is a fistful of gold and a fistful of silver. So Phelim, he couldn't control him, so he said, all right, you can have the gold and silver. And he gave them to him. And he said goodbye, and Dovrush thanked him. And Phelim never thought he would see his harbour again. So Dovrush went off and he put the gold and silver in a bag and he put some bread and cheese and extra clothing. And he put his harp in his otter skin bag and he headed off towards Schlievmish. And it took him three days and three nights to climb that mountain and to get to the place where he thought Mish might be. So he took his cloak off and he laid it on the ground and he scattered the coins, the gold and silver coins around the edge of his cloak. And he took his harp out of his bag and he lay down on the cloak. And he opened his trousers to reveal his manhood. And then he took the harp on his chest and he began to play. The sweetest music that had ever been heard on Schlieve Mish. Now Mish, of course, wasn't too far away and she heard this strange, beautiful, soothing music. She was very curious. And she came towards Dovrush, who was lying on his cloak. And he, out of the corner of his eye, he could see Mish. And he played and he saw this fearsome, ugly, monstrous looking creature with these long dreadlocks crusted with leaves and mud from 400 years and whiskers and her long talons and this wild look in her eyes. And when he finished playing, he was petrified. She came towards him and she said, Are, are you a human? And he said, I am, but don't hurt me, don't hurt me. And she said, no, no, I won't, I won't hurt you. What is that, she said, pointing to the harp. And he said, oh, that's my harp. And she said, I remember my father had a harp. Just some tears began to roll down her cheeks as these memories came back. And he played her another tune to calm her down. And when he finished, she said, oh, and, and what are those pointing to the coins? And she, he said, oh, that's gold and silver. And she said, I remember 
My father had gold and silver. And then she points to him and she says, and what are these? Oh, they're my nest eggs. Hmm, I don't know what that is. And, and she pointed to the other thing she saw now. She was really curious and she said, what is that? Oh, that's my cron clish. A cron clish. Yes, a tricking staff. She said, I don't remember my father having one of those. A cron clish. What's the trick, she said. And he took her by the hand and he laid her down on the cloak and he made love to her. And he caressed her body like he was playing the harp, calling out those noble strings. And she discovered a joy and a bliss and an ecstasy that she had never known before. And as he made love to her, something opened up in her heart. She discovered a wildness, not the wild madness of that crazy woman on the mountain, but her own deep womanly wildness. And as her heart opened up, something happened to Dove Rush too. He opened up. He was fascinated by this strange woman. And when they'd finished making love, and she had a smile on her face. She said, I want another trick. And he said, no, I'm tired. I, I, I need to rest. I play some music on the harp. And she said, no, no, never mind the harp. I want another trick. And he said, but I'm hungry. I'm getting weak. I need to get my strength back. And she said, oh, certainly. So up she jumps and as fast as the wind, she goes off hunting. And within moments, she's back with a young deer under her arm. And she's just about to tear it to shreds as she normally did. And he goes, whoa, whoa, that's not how you do it. Let me do it. So she hands him the deer and he carefully slaughters the deer. And he skins it. And he cuts up the meat into pieces. And he wraps them. He gets some wild coleswood leaves and he makes little parcels and he ties them up with nettle cord. And then he goes off and he collects some firewood and he makes a big, big fire. And when the fire is lighting, he collects large stones and he brings them back and he places them into the fire to heat up. And while the, fire, the stones are heating in the fire, he digs a fulluk tfia, which is a, it's a, it's an Irish word for a, a cooking pit. And he fills it with water from a nearby stream. And when the rocks are red hot, he places them in to the water to boil. And when the water is hot enough, he paces the, the, the parcels of, of deer meat into the water to cook. And he puts some deer tallow in to render down as well. And she is intrigued at this. She's watching. And these memories are coming. And she's curious about this man who makes her feel in this way. When the meat is ready, he takes them out of the Falak Tafia and he lays them out on the cloak and he goes into his bag and he gets some bread and his cheese and he feeds her little morsels with his hand. She's tasting and she says, this is how my father used to cook meat, not the way I'm doing it. This is so much nicer. And she began to experience the joy of eating good food again. And slowly these memories are coming back, remembering life as it used to be. And she said to him, please don't ever leave me. And he looks her in the eye and he said, Mish, I will not leave you. I cannot leave you for I am bound to you. He was so intrigued with this woman. There was no way he could leave her either. His heart was opening up. Something was happening to him also. And when they'd eaten their fill, he takes her by the hand and he leads her into the full of fear and he washes her with the deer tallow and he takes or attempts to take 400 years of mud and filth and grime from her skin and he gathers some soap work growing nearby and he attempts to wash her hair and when she's as clean as he can manage he takes her out and he dries her in the cloak and she's looking at him again and he's holding her and her heart opens up once more and she begins to grieve and the 400 years of pent up grief and sadness and she cries and cries and cries as the tears flow down her cheeks they create two rivers going down the mountain And then he makes love to her again. 
and she's finding peace in her heart and she falls into the deepest of sleeps where she dreams of joy, of laughter, of fun, of her father, of good times, of peace and calm within. And the next morning, Dove Rush wakes up and he sees Mish lying in the deepest of sleeps beside him and he doesn't have the heart to wake her. So he covers her up with a cloak and he makes a little shelter around her and he goes off hunting. And in the meantime, Mish wakes up and she's looking around. Where has he gone? He's left me. I've lost him. Oh no. And she starts to weep and wail and scream and roar. And he hears her and he comes running back and he says, Mish, what's wrong? Why are you crying? And she said, I thought you'd left me. And he looks again into her eyes and he said, I told you, I will not leave you. I cannot leave you. I am bound to you. So they spent many months on the mountain. And every day, her sanity began to return, her memories, peace in her heart. And the love for each other grew and grew. And after about three months, Dove Rush invited Mish to come back down the mountain. And she agreed. And he took out of his bag a dress that he had brought with him that first day. And it is said that her appearance was exactly on that day as it was the day her father died. Her beauty had restored, her hair was now long and golden again, and her eyes as green as the first shoots of spring, and her lips as red as the hawberries at autumn time. And they walked back down the mountain. And they got married and they had four children. And they lived very happily together. And Mish was sought far and wide for her counsel, for she, remember, had the wisdom of the salmon. She had the perception of the hawk. She had the strength of the stag and the endurance of the boar. And they lived together for many, many years until the day that the rush was killed. But that's a story for another day. Shine. So part of this is I would invite questions or comments, what this story might mean to you, because I think there are layers and layers of meaning uh, to this story. And I would be interested in hearing your questions or your comments or what you feel about this story. Okay, folks, if you've got any comments, questions, queries or whatever about the story, can you just raise your hand so that we can see and uh, get you unmuted? I know people have put comments in the in the chat section. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say that uh, we've got from Sharon Hawkins. Yes, the story of Nutria. Jules Bacon. Do we identify her with the mountain? Is she the mountain to some extent? I think that's an interesting one. Hi, Jules. Lovely to see you. Uh, well, with 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 the landscape of Ireland, that often the 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 goddesses or the women, the characters are embedded in in the landscape. I think she's both. Um, she, I mean, she she's called after the mountain. She has that strength and that endurance of a mountain. Mm. I, I'd like to know, Jules, what you think. I'm just trying to find her to. Uh... She's well, she's at the bottom of my screen. <laughs> Ah, yeah. Hi, okay, Jules. Hi, Jules. Hi. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it seems to me that she is, you know, that, that I would read her in as, as part of the land or as the mountain in some way. And that, that was sort of my inclination, so I was just curious if that was what you were thinking too. 
Well, of course, she gives her name to the mountain and that has endured, you know, long, long after the story. Uh, and people may have forgotten the story, but they certainly know the mountain as, as Mish. And that's one way that the goddess can endure in the landscape, given that um, when, you know, Ireland is, well, was a predominantly Christian country and so everything was Christianized. The goddess became sanctified, you know, Bridget became a saint. Uh, many of the goddesses became saints. Uh, it's changing now, I think, with, um, I suppose, the, ri the, the rise of paganism and interest in mythology. People are beginning to recognize the goddess in the landscape. Okay, does anybody else have any uh, comments, questions about the story? As I said, just either post it in the chat. Ah, yes, Melissa Baker. I can relate to all of the story on so many levels. It's made me cry, healing tears of joy. On a separate note, you play the harp beautifully. Wait, Melissa, you're very kind. All I can hear are my mistakes. I'm so critical. So. <laughs> And Sarah Courtney says, I have issues with my microphone, so can I ask a question verbally? What calls to me about this story is this idea of how someone can be perceived one way, the monster on the mountain, when really there is something deeply going on in her, her grief. I, I think absolutely. Um, I think it's a very, very profound story and, and, and what grief can do to us and where it can take to us. Or take us to to um, a place of madness or you know she was also very violent and very dangerous and when um, we are not held in our grief we, it can take us to that place and what really interests me is you know what brings about the healing is um, is love and music and the magic of the harp um, Yes, Anne Beer says, the story says so much about the repression of women's emotions and how love can change that, love and acceptance. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And what's really interesting, now I have put my own twist in the story because um, you, you see how the men go up with their swords trying to control her and it doesn't work. And Phelim recognises that as king. You know, he, has, he is enlightened. He knows she will never mm -hmm. be controlled in that way. And it's not about controlling her. It's about inviting her down. And Dove Rush wouldn't have done it without leaving himself vulnerable. You know, he lies on the cloak. He, he, he reveals his manhood. That puts him in a very, very vulnerable place. And he takes a huge risk. Yes. Um, and it, it pays off because he too is intrigued. Um, Jules says, even in that madness, there's a great yep. power too. There's no... Uh, that's a very interesting, the different kinds of wildness. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's, it's when we engage in a vulnerable way. And I suppose any kind of intimacy or love and healing is about being vulnerable and being willing to be vulnerable. And that story, and it's the, it's, it's the man as well as the woman being vulnerable. That, uh, well, I, I, I am, uh, Linda's tamed by a dick, a sword by a dick. It's, I wouldn't see it as tamed. I think he, he left himself very, very vulnerable. And it was also um, calling out those strains, that joyful, that, um, that, that, that sorrowful strain, because she needed to experience her grief because she had locked it deep in her heart. She needed to let that, to let that out. And that was through music. And then to um, have that sense of healing and calm through the, 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 the lullaby. Mm -hmm. And Andrew Smith puts up, uh, is it about trying to use our intellect, the swords, to control our emotions? It's a very interesting question. And mm. um, uh, I'd like to hear your answer to that, Andrew, because um, when can we? Uh, well, I know I'm a psychologist and they talk about rational emotive therapy, that if you think rational thoughts, you'll have uh, happy feelings. And if you think negative irrational thoughts, you have one. It doesn't always work that way because you uh, love, you can't think yourself into love. You can't trust somebody with your mind. It has to come from the heart. And, and love is the same, uh, that uh, we have to allow ourselves to express our emotions rather than control them. There's another one. Yep. Uh, yes, Sarah. Uh, Sarah Courtney. 
it raises a question for me that do we, I one, perceive something stroke someone in this world differently to how they should? Could I provide the love, care, harmony to help them connect with me stroke us? It's a, it's a really interesting question because mm. that whole story is, it, it, it does, Sarah, it makes sense. I think it's, when you think of what the Rush did, he left himself very, very vulnerable. Um, she could have devoured him very, very easily. He just left himself vulnerable. And that was a different way of being, I imagine, for him and compared to all of the other people who went up there. Um, it's also a very giving, a very courageous thing to do. How many of us would actually do that with somebody hmm. who's as mad as Mish was in order to, to support her? It's a really interesting one. Um, Paul Palmer says, the hero of even this myth is a man, in this case, a gentleman. Do you find true heroines in any of the Irish myths? I think Mish is a heroine. Hmm. I absolutely do. I mean, um, she also saved him. Something happened to him in the story. Um, I think there's there are two very, very strong people in that story. Yes. Hey, right. Um, Jules Bacon, the gifts of the goddess and the mountain are brought to the people through the vulnerability and risk-taking of people, not through their efforts of control. Yep. And Eleanor... Eleanor Sloan says, does she represent the spring, having gone through the darkness of the winter, her grief, and now she's feeling the reawakening of the spring, her hope. She has had a dark night of the soul. I hadn't thought of that, Eleanor, but I think that's a really nice way of um, describing that. I hadn't, I hadn't mm. looked at it that way, but I, I really like that. Thank you. I think that's really, really nice. And Sharon Hawking is seeing her for who she truly was instead of what she had become. Absolutely, yeah. Well, there. And Anne Beer comments, the association with water, rivers of tears, says so much too, flowing energy. Absolutely. And, I mean, we have to allow ourselves to grieve and feel pain. She had locked it up for 400 years. And somehow, with a loving somebody... Um, who, my battery is going to run out. I don't know why. Excuse me. I'm fine now. Sorry about that. <laughs> that um, being in, in, in connection with somebody who accepts her can allow us, or when we're in, that, in a relationship with somebody, that we can um, allow ourselves to heal. I think that's really, really important, that connection with, um, rather than seeing being re rescued, it's that connection with another who's willing to be vulnerable with you that you can find that um, place to heal. I think it takes a lot of courage to heal. If you've had one way of being like 400 years of madness on a mountain, killing mm. everything that comes within sight, it takes a lot of courage to change that way, to leave yourself vulnerable to another. Yes, to drop your guard. Um, yeah. Uh, and then... Sarah Courtney says, that idea of the winter yeah. spring is amazing. It it does echo the story of the wheel of the year. It, it certainly does, yeah. I'm mm. really, I really, this is why, this is great when sessions like this, when I learn, I, I discover a different, or I hear a different perspective that I hadn't looked at before. So thank you for that. Okay, whoops. The power of someone just being present to our grief without trying to fix, in inverted commas, us from Julie Rahm. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. um, when you think of ourselves, if anyone tries to fix me, I mean, straight away the defences go up and uh, I resist with all I can. I hate the idea of anyone trying to fix me because it's around controlling where it's that being present uh, just allows me to do that myself. And I imagine this was the same idea with, with Mish. Mm -hmm. And Jules comments, the spring theme is so interesting, the river's flowing too. Mm -hmm. I just want to go back to Paul. I think it was Paul who mm -hmm. mentioned, um, are there heroines in... Um, yes. There, there, there are a lot of strong women in the stories, um, but often there's a patriarchal slant 
uh, like Maeve um, was the, well, she was a queen and a goddess. She She's sovereignty, so very, very powerful. Uh, there's the Morrigan is, 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 um, she's more than a war goddess. Maka, by they're the, the three sisters, the crows, the ravens. Um, they're also protectors. Um, yeah. uh, who else? Danu is the, is the mother of them all. Bridget, the, the, you know, she's the goddess of healers. She's the, the goddess of smiths. She's the goddess of poets, inspiration. So she works with both fire and uh, water. Um, incredibly powerful. Uh, so I think we have a lot. Even the mm. power of the Kalyuk, the crone, they kill her off in the end, yeah. you know, unfortunately, both in Scotland and, and, and in Ireland. But we're going to work on that. But she has given her... <laughs> the thing is, there's Schlieve Nikali. It's um, in Loch Crew County Meath where there are cairns there aligned to the equinox. So her name is there and, and in other places. So if people have forgotten, the stones and the land haven't forgotten. So it's around for us mm. to reconnect and remember. Um, Andrew Smith comments, uh, trying to fix can be a barrier between clinicians and patients. And yet uh, once we feel love, Therapy needs to move on to guidance to help us heal ourselves. Absolutely. I think, first of all, it's about the relationship. It's about that connection. And like, you know, when we connect with the landscape, we connect with the space, we connect with each other. Once we have that, then doors open or pathways mm. open to healing, uh, further growth or um, inspiration or creativity, all of that. But what is, is relationship is key. Yes. Okay, do we have any more comments? I'll try to keep my eye on hands up and the screen and the chat window. It looks like we've gone a little bit quiet now. Aha, uh -huh. and beer. Uh, it's also beautiful, the young man is a musician, an artist. He is not a typical patriarchal figure. Or typical page pair arc, sorry. Yeah, and, and and absolutely, and it's that um, um, through music, through the arts, through the bardic arts, so much healing is there, and that um, I suppose when you're, well, I I don't have a weapon, so I mean I I don't use that, so I don't know what um, someone's relationship to their sword is. But that your relationship to your instrument or the harp, uh, you know, an absolute um, soul uh, connection is so, so deep. And when you play music, how it really, really touches people. Um, this is Sarah Courtney. I find it easier mm. to connect with the Irish goddess figures purely as they seem to always connect with the land or river. So you can literally go there to places to connect. With. That is so true, um, uh, Sarah that it and that is so so beautiful that they're she's there everywhere yes um andrew comments about term um, therapy he said he thinks that's why indirect art therapies work and sharon agrees yeah mm -hmm. I, I i would agree i would agree with you too as well yeah mm. Okay. Right, I think we've gone a bit quiet now. Uh, so if there isn't anything up, oh, Sharon Hawkins says, I love the land remembering. It's the spirit of place. And Eleanor asks, Eleanor Sloan asks, as a storyteller, do you ever tell a new myth that can show the strength of women and the goddesses in a more accessible way, still giving the message, but in a more modern way. I haven't done that. Maybe you're giving, you're putting a challenge to me, Eleanor. Uh, maybe that's something I look at. Sometimes it's um, around telling a story that 
if it's modern, it, I, and I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm correct here, but this is just off the top of my head. But I think you've actually, it's an interesting thing to to consider that when it's an old story, somehow it can you can allow it in more. Hmm. That there's something magical or fantastical about it because it's uh, because it's the past yeah. or it's historical. It's mythological that sometimes that might be uh, more accessible in some way. But because uh, it's interesting, you're talking about it in a more accessible way. See, I love this. To me, these are really accessible. But I take your point. Maybe this is something I need to consider, but in a more modern way. That uh, I don't know. Maybe films do that. Maybe novels do that already. Mm. Uh, where I like to go back to the stories. There's there's a. There's a difference between hearing a story from the past and reading a book or watching a film. There's something else. There's a that magical piece um, that calls to me. Mm -hmm. But I think it's you. You've made an interesting point, Eleanor. Yes, it's, I think in some ways, perhaps as well, that the the use of the story and the historical context makes as you say makes it more accessible to some people who perhaps if it was put in a more modern form would resist it because they would see it as ah yes that's a myth so but the inner message still gets through to them so and it was clarified i think i mean in a way that could inspire younger women the same story but perhaps seeing from a different viewpoint mm. yeah um Pip, uh, Penelope says, when you tell an older story over and over again, it creates its own thread and weave and can bring the past through to the present. I think that's beautifully put, Philippa. Or Penelope, sorry. I'm, you've got three <laughs> names there. So. <laughs> and, think... Sorry, go on. Um, Ellen Liz says, I think I mean, yes. Yeah, so you said that. Uh, Erica says, I've just adored listening to the story shared today. As I begin to connect more to my Irish ancestry, this is the first story I've heard. There's musicality that speaks directly to my heart. Thank you so much. Thank you for and saying that. It's really interesting what stories do that mm. something that's too direct won't, because sometimes there's that thing about um, it can be like a lecture rather than that creative round without pointing fingers that somehow um there are layers and layers to a story and that actually it, it touches your heart which i think mm -hmm. is, is the magic of story yes. and julia says uh, julia ram says i find it inspiring as a younger woman but everybody has different tastes Absolutely. And just as places resonate differently, you, you listen to different music, you know, what I like, you might not like, or even with people, I think it's the same with, um, with stories and types of stories. Different things resonate with people differently. Um, somebody made a, I love the land remembering. And there's something when we go to a place, different sites, I don't know if you visit various places, but some you will prefer to others that there's different resonances. Um, each and one to their taste yes and Sharon Hawkins says I felt it was so relevant today for those who've experienced trauma it gives hope to being able to process trauma and what it takes to be able to do so thank you for that um, Sharon mm. um, it's really interesting I started telling that story a few years ago and each time I tell it, I get a different perspective on it. And just listening to your comments has really helped me look at it in another way again. I don't always tell it in the same way. I mean, obviously, it's the, the same structure. But I've learned that my understanding of this story deepens with each telling. Mm -hmm. And I, I find that fascinating, that the process of storytelling um, helps and develops this, the, 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 an understanding. Mm -hmm. um, Paul Palmer says there's much that is hidden beneath the patriarchal slant but the challenge is to find it without rewriting the myths versus reinterpreting them yeah, I think 
absolutely now it's really interesting you talk about rewriting um you know storytelling is is is, is an oral and a lot of the stories we have um you know they come from an oral culture i mean the, the mm. they were written down by the monks yeah. but they were oral already mm-hmm. and 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 stories are meant to be relevant to the audience of the time and that yes. uh, they're not cast in stone and told exactly as they are because there's an art there's an there's an art to storytelling so like when i tell that story i um that i um it, it it's always different now uh, it's funny it's different it's it's much easier telling a story to a physical audience where you can actually see people's um, um, facial expressions mm-hmm. that uh, it, it'll always be different in a, that oral traditions are not loyal to the original story in the sense that they can because I hear it differently too. And when it goes on that, um, yeah, this is what Jules says. It seems to me that telling and retelling even then yeah. changes, maybe because of the changes of what keeps the story alive. I think so. I, I think so. Um, uh, I think that's really, really important that, that yeah, uh, Penelope says they evolve. And I think that's how they're meant to be. Um, oh, but there's so many comments now that's hard to... Uh, <laughs> and Andrew Smith says, when I hear stories from other lands or other times, sometimes I translate them internally into my experience of the land and times around me. And it helps with the story's timelessness. I, I think that's lovely, Andrew. And also there's a universality of stories, you know, to stories. Mm. So, I mean, you hear a story from India, for example, and like what you're doing is you're translating them into your own experience in your own landscape and that they have a, a resonance and a relevance mm. for you in 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 your land uh, i think that's beautiful um okay there's certainly been some fascinating comments on there and indeed the some really good questions and it's nice to see that we're seeing different nuances of the, the topic being explored just through the comments Yes, I really appreciate that. It's 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 really helpful for me. So, uh, I'm telling a story, but then I'm ah, I'm having another look at it again, which is great. <laughs> and that's that that evolution a bit. Uh, Amber says, "Can you tell us a bit about the origins of the story and how it came down to the present day?" Well, it's an interesting story in that it's it's not an ancient, ancient, ancient myth. Um, so it was written maybe around the 1200s so so if she was 400 years what's four from 12 800 maybe that's when she (laughs) um it's 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 in terms of the mythology it's 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 a modern story i mean much more modern than um and i've got there's some very small obviously i've embellished it uh in the original story, they don't mention the three noble strains, but they do talk about the rush being a harper. So what do harpers do? They play those. They're very, very important in Irish mythology, those um, three strains. Um, what's interesting about the three strains is they were the three strains that were discovered uh, when Boan, the goddess of, who gives her name to the river Boyne, um, when she gave birth to Angus Og. So the the gyanthri, the joyful strain, is the or sorry, the painful strain is the pain of childbirth and the first cries of the baby when the baby's born. The joy is the joyful strain of having given birth, and then the suanthri is the sol- the lullaby or the soothing strain, is when both mother and baby are sleeping peacefully after after birth after the birth. So uh, so I added that. What is in all of the stories is about the Kronklish, the tricking staff and the nest eggs and the harp and the gold and silver. And that's really interesting because when you think of, um, we were very um, sexually repressed in Ireland until uh, 20 years ago. We actually didn't have any sex until television came, according to a famous politician, when he was giving a speech. So there was no sex in Ireland until television, Aaron. So for, for that to have been stressed in 
in the story is really, really interesting. Mm. Okay, we're just coming up to eight o'clock. Um, does anybody have any further questions, comments? And Anne thanks you for that wonderful response, <laughs> as indeed do we all. <laughs> You're welcome, Anne. <laughs> okay, anyone? Uh, Kerry Scott says, thank you so much for this. It was lovely. You're and welcome. Isabel Andrade says, beautiful meeting. Sharon Hawkins, it's been a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Haha, <laughs> from Sarah Courtney. Thank you so much, Shumir. I'm on the Bardic grade at the moment, so learning the art of how the story can teach. Thank you. you. That's me... wonderful. Welcome, Sarah. I hope you enjoy your path. It's, it'll be magical for you. Great. And I've just started today as well, Sarah. So oh, welcome you, aboard. Lemon. I have. <laughs> oh, welcome, welcome. Uh, great. Yeah, there are, there are a number of um, names I recognise. And uh, so it's, it's lovely. You're very, very welcome, uh, Ellen. Thank you kindly. And Julia Ram says, that was really deeply meaningful for me. Allowed some grieving and tears for, to flow for me today. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, Talam says, welcome, everyone. And Sarah says she started in January and it's been an amazing journey so far. That's wonderful to hear. It, it, it was an amazing one for me and it still is, actually. <laughs> so, uh, and it's just lovely to, I mean, it's amazing with, with, with all of this, but to be able to have this platform and to engage. I never thought it would be possible to be able to tell stories online and to have an audience or viewers to engage in this way. It's not the same mm. as being in the real thing, but you know, like mm. Jules is in the US and I don't know where other people are from. Uh, um, and I'm in Ireland and you're in the UK and then you've, Julie is in Spain and I can't remember where it's all these people in the US. Oh, Sarah's Wexford. Okay, so you're not too far away. Um, but how lovely it is that we can actually meet on this platform to be able to do that and to engage in conversation. It's 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 really lovely. Eleanor's in Scotland. Lovely. Yep. <laughs> Norfolk. Okay. Yeah. Oh, Montreal. Um, Montreal and I didn't yeah. know where you were. It's Montreal. Okay. Okay. If there's no more questions... Um... Oh, sorry, Hertfordshire from Talam. <laughs> uh, are you Talav? Have I pronounced your name properly? Oh, Talla. Okay. Ah, my apologies, Talla. Oh, it's not, it's not an Irish. It's not an Irish word then. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, on behalf of us all. Yeah. Thank, can I thank you so much? This has been an absolutely, oh, absolutely fascinating session. Um, one of the most enjoyable ones that we've had, I think. Oh, and very kind. Hopefully, touch wood. Uh, next year, we may be able to persuade you to come back and do a a similar talk again. That would be lovely. Possible. I'd love to. Okay, yeah, we're st oh, now getting some comments. Uh, Jules saying, uh, so as uh, so wonderful that's, as always. That's Goramila Mila Mahagats. That's a, an acronym for Irish. Jules is an Irish scholar. She's in the US, but she comes to Ireland to learn Irish. Oh, I see. Thank you. And Isabel says, Portugal says goodbye. Wish you a wonderful evening. Thank you. Andrew Smith, thank you. And on behalf of us all, thank you once again. It was lovely to, to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. You, it was our kind. pleasure. <laughs> okay, and thank you all for coming along, um, posting the questions. And on behalf of the DBF and the CFPS, can I wish you all a very pleasant what remains of the weekend. And good night. <laughs>